Здравствуйте, уважаемые товарищи. Hello, dear comrades. We are beginning to study the topic, which in our society is called economics. We have explored the six generalized priorities of governance. And you remember, the simplest priority is the sixth priority – force of arms. But despite its simplicity, it does not ensure stable governance. There are higher priorities for increasing stability. So, the fifth priority is a weapon of genocide, which allows one to influence the psyche of people, intoxicate their minds, addict them to alcohol, drugs, tobacco, medicine, and other psychotropic substances. This priority provides a greater stability of governance compared to the sixth one, but nonetheless does not provide high stability of governance, since the leader of a tribe or the president of a country may come out of the state of intoxication. Therefore, to increase the stability of governance, there is the fourth priority, the economic one. When they lend money to the leader of the tribe at interest, and his children and grandchildren will have to pay. This is the subject of our conversation today, the economic priority of generalized means of governance. Well, you know, in order to ensure the plundering of people with the help of usury, to stupefy people with all sorts of psychotropics, poison and kill them in all kinds of wars, in inter-ethnic and inter-religious conflicts, there exist more powerful priorities. The third priority is the processing and programming of people's consciousness on the basis of ideologies, religious cults, beliefs, secular ideologies. From the standpoint of the second priority, an erroneous interpretation of various facts or an abundance of contradictory facts is given, in which a person is simply hopelessly entangled. On the basis of historical myths and their algorithmics, certain ideologies, religious cults are formed, on the basis of which people can also be kept in obedience. Finally, the most powerful priority is when people are given such knowledge that does not allow them to see the world holistically. This priority in the conception of social safety is called methodological worldview. Aren't slaves supposed to work well? Yes, they are. Therefore, they need to be given some knowledge, but no one gives holistic knowledge, because the slave masters do not want their slaves to understand more than they do. All this is realized through the system of preschool, primary, secondary, higher and academic education. Once again, I have listed all the priorities, generalized means of governance over people. And among all these priorities, today we will consider the economic priority. I would like you to keep all the other priorities together in your mind when you look into the economic priority, because they are always applied together in practice. You just need to understand and be able to see which of the priorities prevails over society in a given historical situation. So, it turns out that there is no economic science either here in Russia or abroad. Why? The great Russian scientist Mendeleev said that science begins where one begins to measure. So, there exists no exact mathematical model that would describe the functioning of macroeconomic systems. Why? Because if you create, develop and make publicly available such a model, then it will become clear how people are plundered, how they are deceived with the help of usury and other illusory ideas about how the economy functions. For this reason, such a model does not exist. All our economies, democratizers, are guided by Western economic science, and the Western economic science does not give answers to all these questions. There is an economist named Vasily Leontiev, who was called a luminary of economics. He died relatively recently. So, he came to the solution 
of the input-output balance equation. He set a task, but then he said that such a task was unsolvable. For this, he was awarded the Nobel Prize, as he did a very good job for the global predictor. He said that such a task could not be solved, but in fact, this is a system of linear equations, that is, the task is solvable. But in order to solve it, restrictions have to be applied to the goal-oriented function. And the application of restrictions is a question on a person's needs. In other words, what a person needs and what a person does not need. Consequently, we think that Leontief, possessing certain knowledge and mathematical apparatus, could not but have known how to solve this task. But this is a matter of his true nervousness. And completing the thought about our democratizers, who are guided by the Western economic science, which, by the way, did not make our life in the USSR and in Russia happy, but on the contrary, led to a crisis. I'd like to say that this luminary of economics, Leontiev, in his economic essay of the 1990s edition, volume 1, on page 218, writes, This unlimited, universal availability of knowledge and ideas by research is certainly a very desirable, I emphasize, Leontief says, desirable, property for society and for mankind as a whole. How can one understand this word desirable? And then what does undesirable mean? But it creates a serious problem for anyone who would like to engage in research, that is, in the production of knowledge as a business enterprise, that is, for profits. To justify investment in research, a corporation must be able to sell its results directly or indirectly as a component part of some other product for a price. But who would pay for a good which, once it has been produced, becomes available to everyone in an unlimited amount? Why not wait until someone else pays for it or invests in its production and then have a free ride? Who would want to enter the bakery business if seven loaves of bread baked by anyone could steal the hunger not only of a multitude of 4,000 men and women and children besides, as is told in the New Testament, but also of anyone else who cares to partake of it? This quote contains the entire Biblical Talmudic elite corporate sociology, pleasing to the global supra-Jewish predictor, including both economic science and Marxism. And this is the fear of their own worthlessness. After all, people, like scientists, think like this. I discover something, do something useful for people, for the super-system, so that the super-system repels the pressure of the environment and releases elements to fulfill the mission entrusted to them from above. I am doing research here. Why do I have to share this? I must sell the results of my research more profitably. That's how I can make money. In other words, this is where true nervousness manifests. Speaking of real possibilities of economics of the West, which all our democratizers are guided by, I'd like to quote one of the presidents of the Econometric Society. Consider what he states. Theoretical assumptions and unobserved facts, written by Leontiev, page 2. The achievements of economic theory in the last two decades are both impressive and in many ways beautiful. But it cannot be denied that there is something scandalous in the spectacle of so many people refining the analysis of economic states, which they give no reason to suppose will ever or have ever come about. It is an unsatisfactory and slightly dishonest state of affairs. These are all the possibilities of the so-called economic science of the West, which cannot explain what is happening in the so-called economic world. So what is happening? The fact is that one has to view the processes associated with the conduct of the national economic complex 
from the standpoint of governance and the correspondence of this governance to its own goal setting, according to the hierarchy of governance which exists in creation. Therefore, in the conception of social safety, what is called economics is defined as follows. Economics is the reproduction of generations in connection with their reproduction and the accumulation of material and non-material products produced in a social unification of labor. In this very process of reproduction of generations, life in technocratic and technological civilizations is concluded. The concept of the content of national economic complex issues of life significance, vision, understanding, description of cause-effect relationships is much broader than the range of interests of traditional economic sciences. The latter avoid considering. The process of reproduction of generations in the biosphere. The analysis of nervous, demographic, cultural, environmental, etc. consequences of production. What does traditional economics really do? It deals with issues, for example, like raising the production of some studs, bushings by half a percent, or making oil pumps work faster. And how such an increase will impact everything else? Economics does not say. It does not consider a national economic complex in connection with everything else. But we already know that the word nervousness comes from the Russian word nravitsa, which means to like. And these words have one and the same root, nrav, and reflect the objective adherence of a person's thoughts and outwardly visible actions to what he, a person, does not perceive as evil and or to what his willpower is objectively subordinated. All this will inevitably be reflected in statistics of mass phenomena, national economic complex, culture of society, economics, and so on. Note that real nervousness of a person, but not the declared one, is meant. Therefore, we should clearly distinguish between declared nervousness which is fed to us from TV screens, for example, or which is declared by many people, and real nervousness, which manifests in reality. That is, in words people say one thing, but in reality we see that their real nervousness is completely different. So, for example, in Russia priests said one thing, but they always did another one. So people did not support them in 1917, when the Bolsheviks were demolishing their power. However, after Stalin, general secretaries of the party also said one thing, but did another in reality. So the people did not support the party nomenclature either. This does not mean that people could express their understanding in clear lexical forms, but they sensed that something was wrong in the statistics of social processes and mass phenomena. However, the most difficult thing is to find a non-correspondence and admit it in oneself, when in words one says one thing, but in reality the thing differs from what is declared. There is a ring enclosure in time, which lies at the core of the informational content of a person and society. So, for a single person, objective nervousness as the choice of the line of external and internal behavior is a developed individual sense of measure of a possible and impossible way of achieving the wanted on the basis of mastered knowledge. That is, the mastery of knowledge comes on the basis of a developed sense of measure. The more knowledge and skills a person masters, the more objective nervousness is formed. For society, culture, conscious and unconscious knowledge, unconscious skills, and objective nervousness of society, which may or may not be incompatible, influence the sense of measure, which determines new skills, and they in their turn are reflected in concepts and terminological apparatus of knowledge. The latter shapes the culture. 
So, the sense of measure does exist. And we already know that every person has it. And it allows him to master new skills, which leads to the mastery of new knowledge, concepts, and terminological apparatus. On the basis of the worked-out knowledge, the culture of society is formed, on the basis of which objective nervousness of society is formed. And with the incompatibility of objective nervousness of society and the culture of society, the sense of measure changes. The sense of measure is distorted in one way or another but strictly within the measure of errors of the mismatches of culture and real nervousness of society. So the sense of measure can be distorted in relation to culture and real nervousness towards the degradation or towards the improvement and development of true nervousness. Consequently, new knowledge can be obtained on the basis of new nervousness. The perception and production of new knowledge can be presented as follows. It may look like a chain spiral with spiral coils resting on one another. In other words, having the sense of measure in the spiritual accompaniment of real nervousness allows one to form new knowledge, thereby contributing to the formation of a new culture, on the basis of which new nervousness is formed as well as new evaluations that were not previously available in the human psyche. And the existing nervousness is improved towards privacyness. On the basis of new nerves, new knowledge is formed, culture and nervousness are improved, and so on. It should be like this. The primacy of nervousness over knowledge. That is, nervousness should be more important than knowledge since it is nervousness as the spiritual matrixal predetermination of a person that determines the quality of knowledge he produces, the quality and content of his insights, as well as the quality of mastering new knowledge and skills. The primacy of sociology, life interpretation over exact and natural sciences. That is, sociology should be more important and higher in the hierarchy of significance than exact and natural sciences. In the meantime, the reality is such that natural and exact sciences come first. In the second place, sociology and humanities. In the third, the nervousness of the researcher, even if such a question arises, is out of discussion. And in the fourth place, the sense of measure, sovest. This is not something that is not accepted to talk about. This phenomenon is simply not integrated into the circle of concepts of both scientific luminaries and ordinary people. In other words, they simply do not know about sovest and the sense of measure. They are simply not understood, not even considered senses in official sources. It is customary to talk about this only outside of science. But it should be exactly the opposite. The sense of measure and sovist should be in the first place, the nervousness of the researcher in the second, sociology and the humanities in the third, natural and exact sciences in the fourth, since nervousness determines the height of scientific achievements. Dobronravisness in the direction of privacyness and malnravisness in the direction of submitting oneself to temptation. That is, concealment of knowledge, monopolistic possession of knowledge, know-how, which by announcement means I know how, and by default in the informational background I know how, but I won't tell anyone anything for free. So, nervousness due to circular enclosure, can change towards the high spirituality of the life-creating reason, towards intellectually equipped parasitism. Atheism and materialism of Marxism were accepted by the society, because the society nervously degraded in the struggle for power in the crowdly society, subconsciously regarding the governance of society's affairs as an easy feeding trough without any responsibility. This circumstance was caused by malnervousness and ignorance, 
and because of this circumstance, malnourishedness and ignorance continue to thrive. So, why do people climb up the ladder? In order to get more benefits, without understanding processes of governance and shouldering responsibility for their own governance. But this is what the global predictor needs in order to manipulate arrogant and mindless rulers. Therefore, there is no science about governance. There are only some fragments, which are related to the control governance of technical systems. A striking example of such a distortion of Nravi's approach is the theory of Karl Marx. It does not matter whether Karl Marx was fully disabled or just in one of the hemispheres of his brain, but he invented a teaching that would never lead people to true communism. Why? Because two of the three main foundations of Marxism are rotten. The first one is an incorrect formulation of the main question of philosophy. What is primary, matter or consciousness? The second is the total metrological inconsistency of Marx's political economy. His whole theory of surplus value is wrong. In November 1952, Stalin, in his work Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, pronounced the death sentence on Marxism, in which Stalin sets the task for Soviet scientists, saying that it is necessary to reconsider the concepts, foundations of Marxist political economics as inconsistent with what actually exists. And above all, this concerns categories such as necessary labor time and surplus labor time, necessary product and surplus product, and so on. But if these things are removed from Marxist political economics, then nothing will remain of it at all. So why did the people buy it? They fell for the third part, because it was about a private society. Therefore, the book named Capital, which contains Marxist research, the vast majority of people did not read and did not know what he wrote there. But since for privacyness, the people supported this slogan, supposing that Karl Marx and Rosa Luxemburg were the best people on planet Earth. And the people, in fact, by default, refused to study what they followed. In this doctrine, in the informational backgrounds that were formed in culture under the influence of Marxism, an informational mind was planted, which was detonated in the early 90s. The result of this explosion, which appeared in the 90s and still exists in current reality, is that our present generations are still reaping the fruits of the indifference and thoughtlessness of the previous generations, who did not want, in essence, to understand the ideology on the basis of which they lived. Let's look at how Karl Marx refuted the dogma of Adam Smith, a contemporary of Marx. According to Adam Smith, all social capital, that is, all money, is divided into the income of employees, the so-called variable capital, the income of entrepreneurs, the so-called surplus value, which includes payments to the state, personal consumption of capitalists, payment to employees in the future when expanding and modernizing production. That is, it turns out that all the money goes to pay salaries to personnel and capitalist rulers, productive labor and governing labor. In other words, only wages actually circulate in society. Let's consider how Karl Marx refuted this myth's dogma using the example of a jar of jam. As jam, we will consider the price of the product. Marx divides the price of product into three parts. V. The share of variable capital for the payment of its borrowed capital. M. The share corresponding to the surplus value. C. The share corresponding to the constant capital for the payment for production from the outside to itself. But the product from the outside also costs something. 
Therefore, C in its turn falls into the same categories, only in smaller volumes. V1 – the share of variable capital for the payment of its borrowed capital. M1 – the share corresponding to the surplus value. C1 – the share corresponding to the constant capital for the payment for production from the outside to itself. And this division can be considered further. That is, C1 and further breaks down into the same categories of an even smaller scale. And V2, M2, C2 appear. This is how constant capital C appeared in Marxist Leninist political economy. But how can it then be returned to the circulation of monetary means? Marxism cannot do this and therefore keeps duping us further and further. What is all this? In mathematics, all this is called the theory of limits, according to which C tends to zero, which means that the jar of jam will be drained to the bottom. In other words, Adam Smith was right. But many scientists, economists, Marxists have accepted this dogma of Marx. Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, in his work Eugene Onegin, spoke like this about the price of goods and the economy. Lacking the fervent dedication that sits in sounds life's highest quest, he never knew, to our frustration, a dactyl from an anapest. Theocritus and Homer bored him, but reading Adam Smith restored him, and economics he knew well, which is to say that he could tell the ways in which a state progresses, the actual things that make it thrive, and why for gold it need not strive, when basic products it possesses. His father never understood and mortgaged all the land he could. To put it differently, Pushkin, who was a contemporary of Karl Marx, in fact raised the question, is it gold that we eat or is it paper dollars? Once again, you need to understand the simple thing. Goods and services circulate in one direction, money in the other, and there must be a correspondence between the mass of goods and money. If there is more money, we have inflation. If there is less money, we have deflation. And in general, if there are enough goods everywhere, that is, there is no shortage, deficiency, then money is not needed either. Do we need to buy air? No, we don't. There is already a lot of air. There is no shortage of it. But when is money needed? When there is shortage, deficiency in something. That is, money is a means of distributing consumption in the event of a shortage and deficiency in products. And also, money ensures the circulation of goods. So, we have examined how Karl Marx's malnravisness and everyone else's who follows it allows us to refute what factually lies on the surface. And people perceive this malnravisness, substantiated with scientific theories, and receive scientific degrees and titles for this. It should be noted that there are only two holistic approaches to the description of the processes taking place in the national economic complex. The approach from the point of view of the people's autocracy in the person of the Zhradshut, monarch, state planning commission, etc., which is nervously in agreement with God's design. According to the Quran, demonism is concluded in the self-delusion of a person on the basis of his free will. From the point of view of a private trader, based on the interests of one of the many private traders, the goal is to take care of the growth of private monetary profit. Nervously, this approach is not in agreement with God. But both of these approaches are in agreement with the Christian theology, which is based on the following principle. Satan is the absolute ruler of this world. All sciences and arts are from him. The Christian theology recognizes the absolute power of Satan until the time known to the Most High.
which means until the due date comes, every action is sinful. The entire history is a special operation to save souls from this world. Therefore, the task is to pray and repent. In addition, one should pay attention to the fact that it is religions that determine the world of economic relations. After all, by the way, if we talk about the Bible, then we see that the Bible encourages usury. Remember, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, and so on. And in the Quran, on the contrary, those who swallow usury will not rise, except as someone driven mad by Satan's touch. That is because they say, commerce is like usury. But God has permitted commerce and has forbidden usury. As far as you can see, the Quran and the Bible are different in content. So, this pseudo-Christianity triumphs in society, and generally speaking, has become a system-forming factor throughout the world, despite the fact that in some societies there may be other teachings and religions. Consequently, the biblical conception has become the leading one all over the world, and even in places where nothing is known about Christianity at all. So, there exists usury everywhere, right? Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, everyone has usury. And the Jews also have usury. But they just do not lend upon usury to their brothers, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. And on this basis, the corresponding economic theories, ideologies, history, politics, interpersonal relations are created. The question is, why hasn't the pseudo-Christian teaching made the life of people on the whole planet, part of which is the conduct of the national economic complex, a single Christian country, happy throughout 2000 years? 2000 years is a long enough time. Moreover, there is a noticeable tendency to aggravate the situation. Wars do not stop, even in Christianity itself. Catholics are at daggers drawn with Protestants. Orthodox Christians do not agree with Catholics. But the historically real Jesus demonstrated true love with his sermon and his life. Why then, in the economy, should love obediently give way to the cruelest self-eating of semi-resembling human beings? I will quote for you an excerpt of Jesus from the Apocrypha, the essence gospel of peace, forbidden by the Church, whether are these words of Jesus Christ. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I tell what is to come, and know all secrets and all wisdom, and though I have faith strong as the stone which leads mountains from their seed, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and give all my fire that I have received from my Father, but have not love, I am in no wise profited. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, works not evil, knows not pride, is not rude, neither selfish, is slow to anger, imagines no mischief, rejoices not in injustice, but delights in justice. Love defends all, love believes all, love hopes all, love bears all, never exhausts itself, but as for tongues, they shall cease, and as for knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we have truth in part and error in part, but when the fullness of perfection is come, that which is in part shall be blotted out. When a man was a child, he spoke as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child, but when he became a man, he put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass and through dark saints. Now we know in part, but when we are come before the face of God, we shall not know in part, but even as we are taught by Him. And now remain these three, faith and hope and love. 
but the greatest of these is love. And now I speak to you in the living tongue of the living God, through the Holy Spirit of our Heavenly Father. There is none yet among you that can understand all this of which I speak. He who expounds to you the Scriptures speaks to you in a dead tongue of dead man through his diseased and mortal body. Him, therefore, can all men understand, for all men are diseased and all are in death. No one sees the light of life. Blind man lives blind on the dark paths of sins, diseases and sufferings, and at the last all fall into the pit of death. There is something to ponder on after all these words. It should be remembered that all processes in creation, including in human society, are rulable. And here is a scheme applied to the national economic complex. So, there is a national economic complex. This is an object of governance. And society is a subject of governance. That is, society in all its diversity governs the national economic complex, conducts it in a certain way and thereby exerts a governing impact on it. There also exists a result that can be evaluated by people as acceptable or unacceptable. And the governance over the national economic complex is inscribed in conceptual governance. This scheme looks more detailed. Here is the national economic complex on which society exerts a governing impact. This governing impact in society is formed on the basis of the Bermuda Triangle of the state bodies of legislative, executive and judicial types of power. This Bermuda Triangle is enclosed to the global power of the satanic design of life arrangement by the global predictor through a pluralism of opinions, a hodgepodge of ideological rubbish in formational minds. Therefore, in order to get rid of the problems that exist in all of humanity today, one should abandon the Satanism, begin to accurately and strictly determine opinions on all issues of life, develop jointly united opinions, that is, come to a unity in opinions, and thereby to move to the fulfillment of God's designs, working towards the goals that the highest hierarchical encompassing governance has set to us. As you can see from the scheme, the economy is not a guarantee of solving all problems. It is only an expression of the adequacy of the conception by which we all live. It will not be possible to solve the problems in the economy until we change the conception. When we consider their material further on, these two schemes should be kept in mind. Today, professors of economics, scientists, economists, Luminaries of the so-called economic science talk and argue about which economy is better, planned or market economy. At the same time, it is assumed by default that the planned economy is a compulsory regulation of production and consumption in a directive addressing way. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev told everyone to sow corn, so everyone sowed corn all over the country. That is, there was a plan that was achieved in a command administrative manner. As for the market economy, it implies a self-regulating kingdom of freedom. They say, do what you want, buy, hire, fire, produce, but sell things for higher prices in order to have profits. A state, a country, in the market economy mode, must control the public state sector and levy taxes. Herewith, a private trader can buy goods from the state and resell them at a higher price. That is, by default, in the informational background, it is assumed that the public state sector is one thing and the market is another. It is like these things are not supposed to be interconnected. But from the standpoint of the sufficiently general theory of governance and autocracy, people's power, it is not like that. What is a plan? A plan is a vector of goals of governance. Can a plane fly nowhere? No. Can the state move nowhere? No. And even if the goals are not obvious, anyway, they still exist. They are known just to someone else. There is nothing aimless in creation. 
all processes are governed. There are no ungoverned processes. But it is not always people who carry out governance. Governance can be carried out by higher levels of the hierarchy of creation up to God. But since there is a process, then there is governance. And since there is governance, then there is a vector of goals, a vector of current state, and a vector of error. The law of the universe is such that a fragment of the universe creation cannot exist or a process cannot proceed outside the goal-oriented function. So, a plan is a vector of goals, meanwhile the party-state governance is a structure, a structural method of governance. Under the Central Committee of the Communist Party, the vector of goals was achieved in a structural way. There were structures, the Central Committee, the Party Committee, the Trade Union Committee, and so on. What then is the market economy in terms of the sufficiently general theory of governance? Adherents of the market economy say, demand creates its own supply. A private trader is interested in profit, but he allegedly subordinates his activity to demand. According to the sufficiently general theory of governance, aggregate demand is a vector of goals which in the market may be unknown to either society or a state. But if the vector of goals is unknown to anyone, moreover, many do not even understand that there should be a vector of goals, then there will always be someone smarter and on the basis of the principle, every person within the boundaries of the measure of his understanding works for himself, but within the boundaries of the measure of his non-understanding, he works for those who know and understand more, that someone smarter will set his goals and thus inscribe everyone aimlessly participating into certain processes that market participants will not be aware of. In the market model, the structuralist method dominates over the structural one. The market mechanism is based on the financial credit system. In other words, the market is a structuralist way of governance. When such pressure is exerted on the mass of people, so that everyone works towards achieving the set goals. In the conception of social safety, we say that the market is a good way of implementing people's opportunities, but these opportunities need to be organized and directed towards achieving certain goals. That is, the plan is a vector of goals, and the market is a way to achieve the plan in a structural way. Therefore, when the planned economy is opposed to the market economy, it is schizophrenia. Outside the theory of governance, it is impossible to oppose the planned economy to the market one, since in this way, the vector of goals, plan, and one of the methods of governance, structural's method in the market, are opposed. By analogy, the plan is the city to which we have to come, and the market is the road along which we can come to the city. Moreover, there are two roads. One road is a structural way, and the other is a structural's way. The structureless way is better, because everyone knows what to do. Imagine, we sit in the Kremlin and govern. We have structures in Kamchatka, Magadan, Vladivostok, Siberia. And we sit in the Kremlin and simply do not have time to track what is happening in the regions no matter how hard we try. So, it is necessary to transfer the system into a self-governing mode. But this mode must be organized, that is, the market must be governed. And here, economists oppose planned and market economies. We must also see the role of the financial credit system in the governance over the national economic complex. The market mechanism is based on the financial credit system. The backbone nodes of the financial credit system are ministries of finance, the transnational system of banks. The financial credit system is a volume of loan, its distribution via industries and productions, subsidies to producers, a volume and method of issuance of means of payment, subsidies to consumers. The entrepreneur is forced to subordinate his business activity 
to the effective demand generated by the financial credit system, but not to demand in general. By the way, the effective demand among people is formed by the financial credit system. According to the sufficiently general theory of governance, the financial credit system is one of the subsystems of structural self-governance over society, and loans, subsidies, grants, issuance of money are tools of governance. So, let's draw a scheme of governance. The national economic complex is an object of governance. The financial credit system is a subject of governance, which exerts a governing impact on the national economy, that is, the country's economy. It is the financial credit system that organizes the work of the country's national economic complex. With the help of the aforementioned tools of governance, the market mechanism can be introduced into a stable balancing mode corresponding to a certain vector of goals, introduced into the mode of stable, optimal maneuver of transition from one vector of goals to another. In particular, it was proposed to Gorbachev on the basis of the conception of social safety and the sufficiently general theory of governance to move the country from one balancing mode that had already outlived its usefulness, without conflicts, crises, suffering of the people, to a new balancing mode that would correspond to the main foundations that we already talked about. This transition could have been made calmly without destroying the country and the national economic complex. If this is done, then the structural self-regulation of products exchange will be supported in accordance with a certain vector of goals of a certain quality. Having set the vector of goals, you can introduce the market mechanism into a stable mode. But this has to be based on practical wisdom. Is it good or bad? It is good if there is enough wisdom, which is adequate to objective reality. If this is based on hidden know-how, it is not very good, because I know how, but I won't tell anyone. And this also has to be based on a scientific theory with strict lexical forms. It should be clear where this theory comes from, what kind of theory it is, and what the measure of its adequacy to objective reality is. If this is based on something foolish, then out of foolishness, the collapse of self-regulation mode may be stable. But in modern conditions, behind the shoulders of idiots, there is always a team of mountain driver specialists who, to a certain extent, have practical wisdom, know-how and false knowledge. Look at the way they discuss capitalism in Russia. Is there capitalism in Sweden? Yes, there is. Market? Yes, the market does exist. It's the same in Switzerland. And what about Bolivia and Nicaragua? What do they have? They have capitalism and market. But capitalism and market in Bolivia and Nicaragua are different from capitalism and market in Sweden and Switzerland. Why? Because there exists global politics, according to which some are allowed and others are not allowed. This is the so-called system of guiding lights. So, through a guiding light, others are told, why do you live like this? Look how good the Swedish model is. At the same time, by default, in the informational background, it implies what is allowed for that guiding light, a country, a state. I will give you an analogy from the real life of the USSR. You know, people of my generation used to work in factories mainly. So did I. I was a lathe operator. It was like this in the sphere. A lathe operator of the highest qualification had the best lathe operating machine, the best raw materials, the best lathe cutters, and the rest of the lathe operators had to use worn-out lathe machines. All conditions were created for that guiding light, the lathe operator of the best qualification, and as a result, he exceeded the factory plan. He had a free-of-charge stay in a sanatorium, an out-of-queue right to get an apartment from the state, and other privileges. And the rest also wanted this. 
So they were told, work as hard as that guy and you will have everything. But how? Their machines were in bad condition. They had no cutters of a good quality, and that's it. They couldn't work like that, even if they wanted to. The same thing happens in the world. Here is the United States. Looking at them, many countries try to live the same way. But the United States consume 50% of energy resources. They have good subsidies for American farmers, and so on. But in order for the United States to be prosperous, it is necessary that our agriculture be ruined, that our chicken coops are demolished by bulldozers, and bushlegs are imported to us instead. Just imagine, they bring chicken legs across the ocean, as if we cannot produce these chicken legs in our country. This is called global politics. And if an economist does not understand that this is global politics, then he begins to reason with very abstruse words. He tries to describe the processes from the point of view of some economic theories, writes dissertations and receives a degree of doctor of economics. What schizophrenia it is? Therefore, we say that there is no economic theory and there never has been. Only in the conception of social safety, the authors came to an understanding of this and described economic science in strict lexical forms. They created a formula for the input-output model balance, which was done neither by the economic theory nor by the outstanding economist Vasily Leontiev. The extreme inequality of living standards in countries with self-regulation of the market is proof that the global predictor has its own vector of goals and its own conception of governance in relation to every one of the countries, which are implemented through the system of Zion Freemasonry and international financial organizations. It is very beneficial for the global predictor to have protégés who have their own fingers in the pie. Therefore, the global predictor encourages external decency, internal turpitude, hypocrisy. We are often reproached for getting at the Jews. But we only talk about the fact that Jews are people who are used, and they are not even aware of this fact. The global predictor shifts all the blame onto them. And Jews do not understand this. Speaking of Jews, who among them were killed first of all? These were ordinary people – teachers, tailors, doctors, and so on and the bankers remained alive. So Hitler first released all the bankers and the rich Jews and killed ordinary Jews. We factually talk about this. Speaking about hypocrisy, we affirm that in every person there should be a unity of thoughts, words and doings.